thanks guys for coming. Uh, for the folks at home who will hopefully be listening to this uh, on YouTube or elsewhere, uh, at CCM, at the end of our Certificate in Songwriting and Music Production program, uh, students will be required to present their final EP projects, which they've written, recorded, produced all themselves. Uh, and so Nana is one of our completing students here in this program. And so she's slated to present her work today. And with us also is a uh, good friend of mine. Uh, we've played together in a, in a Calypso pop project. Would you call it yeah. that? Yeah, um, yeah. Island pop. Yeah, yeah. Island pop. Yeah. We, we played in a project together a few years back, but uh, really talented guy, uh, Berkeley grad, uh, bass player who's toured with the likes of people like Selena Gomez and Macy Gray. Uh, right now, uh, he's the a &R manager at a uh, kind of one-stop shop label management group uh, publishing company uh, called Position Music. Uh, you guys are based where? In Burbank? Burbank, yeah. Burbank, yeah. So uh, a jack of all trades and uh, happy to have him here to both talk about his work and uh, provide some feedback for Nana, uh, Mike Torres. So Mike, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to do first is basically, Mike, uh, you're in a &R, so I guess maybe explain for all of us what that means, kind of what your day-to-day -day looks like, uh, what sort of uh, work you do with artists and kind of what your sort of goals are professionally in that role. Yeah, so a &R is pretty much the bridging, the bridge between the creative and the company. So. Um, like my day, I'm working with our writers and producers that are signed to our company. I'm also talking with their business people that are around them, either like management or, uh, you know, primarily like their managers or, and, you know, trying to set up sessions for them. Like the job of a &R really is to, is to like increase the value of the, the publishing value of the people you currently have. So like if I have a writer signed to my company, I want to, I want to help them get into creative situations where they can get, you know, maybe they can get like a pop song with Dua Lipa cut or, you know, or they can just do, get them into creative situations where you can help increase their publishing value. Um, on top of that, I'm always looking for people. So like sign, uh, wanting to sign producers, bands, artists, writers, um, just always having conversations and um, meetings and creative situations of sessions and sometimes with these people you're talking to you realize like oh man like we are working really well together we should bring them into the position family um, position is unique in its uh, we're primarily a publisher so we have a label component and a management branch but it's been a publisher first so we've been a company for 21 years the label has come around in the last like five or six years really and it's developed into a, a pretty great uh, like independent label but we're first and foremost a publisher, and we've always been very focused in synchronization, so sync licensing. Um, so we do a lot of that. It's uh, if, for those who don't know, it's pitching music to like advertisement, film, promos, in in show, uh, video games, like basically putting music into picture. Um, and it's a pretty, it's a booming industry right now within music. It's actually breaking bands now, breaking artists. So uh, we position started 21 years ago with the focus of working with independent artists and writers and producers to do as a publisher, but to like really focus on the sync thing. Because back then, no one was really focused on it. It was actually like back then in like the early 90s, it was like not cool. It's like Madonna, Madonna thought it'd be lame if you got her song in an ad or something. But then uh, as you know, the dark ages of the record labels happened and uh, the value of a master kind of dipped for a while. Um, a lot of people got interested in sync because it's just a really good revenue source and it's a really good way to market your, your artist, your band. Like if I can get a song in an Apple commercial, like I could potentially break that artist and I'm getting paid. So typically you got to market, you got to pay for marketing, you got to pay PR, you got to pay playlisting people, all these things. But sync is kind of that, uh, that golden ticket where it's like, you're getting paid to expose your artist, which is great. Um, so anyway, sync became very cool uh, later because it was making money and, and exposing people and the level of sync got really high. Like it used to be kind of more jingle based and now it's like, 
you know, you have your Lizzo. Lizzo like broke through sync. Like everyone in the sync industry knew who Lizzo was before she had any Grammys or any real uh, like world presence. But um, uh, so now you have like artists of that caliber. It's like Grammy award winning artists that you, you know, your your music has to be, you know, has to kind of be in that arena. So um, so the company's really been grown through sync. And uh, within the last five or six years, the company's tr been transitioning more into a traditional publisher, which is where you have people signed to term deals and, you know, you're collecting on behalf of them and registering their songs, but you're also setting up sessions with artists from RCA or this co-writer from Pulse Music or any of these other type of situations where you're more, you're not sync focused, but you're more like just getting them, introducing them to the right people and putting in the right situation so that they can create music that will hopefully have value. Um, so yeah, my day is split between sync stuff, sessions, and just like calls, like kind of discovery calls and meetings. These days it's like discovery Zoom meetings, but back in the day you would actually meet people, but that's of the olden times. Um, but yeah. So, so when you uh, are, let's say, recruiting talent for position, uh, Specifically for sync, I guess, how, does is there anything that you're looking for that's different uh, about, let's say, signing a, a sync artist to a publishing deal versus, let's say, doing one of these maybe like multi-album deals in a more kind of traditional sense? Are you looking for particular things? Are there, let's say, uh, concerns about uh, positions catalog that you might be, let's say, trying to to Phil, uh, I guess, what's the kind of, is there any sort of discernible difference in tactics uh, for talent search between sync and traditional stuff? Yeah, I mean, in sync, you know, the thing that really tends to work well in sync if you're an, uh, if you're an indie artist or if you're not really well known, so you don't have like the name value to kind of get you a placement is um, stuff that's very left of center and interesting in some way. Cause it's like with the, at the end of the day, if we're being sync focused, the music has to drive picture. So the music has to like really convey an emotion. Like most pop, like it's pretty down the middle by design. You want to reach the widest audience and reach, you know, the widest, just the widest you can. Um, in sync, it's like, if I got a, you know, a, a trailer for uh, the next, um, I don't know, if I got a trailer for the next, uh, Avengers movie or whatever, like it's got to have something in it that really drives picture and drives whatever emotion they're trying to get. So typically when you get these briefs, it's like looking for inspiring and uplifting or looking for edgy and swaggery or looking for confident. They always have these descriptors and your music really has to fit in that lane. That's why like forever the black keys were massive in sync because when you listen to them, they're just cool. It's like kind of swampy and gritty and uh, they call it swagger rock. You know, it's just basically rock and roll with some attitude. So um, that really does well in advertising because like every brand, no matter how clean or edgy you are, you want the audience to feel cool when they listen, when they hear what you are. So it's like, you know, tar even like something like Target or uh, Dole Fruit or whatever, they still want people to feel cool when they hear it. They don't want to, they don't want people to hear this music and think it's corny or lame. So, so Black Keys were a great example of a band that's like not really gratuitous, but like you just listen to like, you can even just listen to the instrumental and you're like, oh man, this is like so cool. Um, so anyways, if, if I'm being sync focused when I'm trying to sign or look for someone, like if it's a producer, I'm looking for production that's like left of center because um, in, in the practice of sync, a lot of times much of the top line of the vocals taken out and they only use key parts. And so the production or the track has to do all the speaking. So it's like, it can't just be like kind of a bed of music. It's gotta be, you know, vibrant or edgy or just have something, these bells and whistles production arrangement wise that that keep a listener engaged without needing top lines. So it's like perfect examples are like if I'm looking at rap, it's like, you know, Run the Jewels is great for hip hop, right? Because it's like they have just like drum samples and vocal chopped things and all these things that if you take out the rap, which is already amazing, but if you take that out, the track just has so many things happening that it works well to picture. It's like if, we, if you turn on Netflix right now, it's like almost like, I would say, like, I mean, this is a terrible statistic. It's not real. But, like, almost it's in my mind, it's almost half of the songs on, on Netflix are Run the Jewels. Like, they're always using Run the Jewels for promos or end of, uh, it was, like, the, um, I just watched, uh, I forget what, what show it was, but, like, the end title credits was Run the Jewels. Like they just keep popping up because it's got so many cool things happening production-wise. Um, but, so, I'm always looking for that no matter what genre it is. If it's pop, you know, it's like, okay, well, what kind of pop? Is it, like, this kind of, like, maybe electronic Lewis the Child, We Then Pop, where it's like really like 
interesting and vibrant and it's got a lot of it has its own unique flavor without needing any type of vocal on it or uh if it's indie is it like are we doing you know are they bringing in just really cool elements and things that are kind of uh that just give a lot of that kind of like paint the picture for the song um so anyways that's always what i'm looking for you know it's not like do they, you know, in pop, you typically as a producer don't want to never overshadow the vocal, right? Like a lot of producers typically will underproduce and then kind of build it up if they need to. But um, in sync, I'm always listening for like the production and of course the top line, the vocal, but like I'm, I'm almost listening for production first just to make sure it just has all the right ingredients in it. So to summarize, I'd say sync is, is, really driven by novelty of sound design and production and sort of maybe drawing from unexpected influences or kind of merging lots yeah, of cross genre. Yeah. And uh, in which case then if you, let's say you said now you're starting to uh, develop your sort of artist uh, artist label side, in which case then uh, what sorts of deals are you are you signing artists to? Are they, let's say, like songwriting deals uh, where, you know, you're citing songwriters as artists or songwriters, you know, uh, like ghostwriting for other people on your label? Like what sorts of deals are you are you issuing right now? Yeah. So, well, if we're so we do publishing deals and then we'll do like master like label deals. Right. So um, on the pub side, we we do have like what are traditional deals where it's typically a multi-year term and you get an advance in the beginning and then you're kind of married as a company and as a creative for that period of time. So that's what the, the more traditional deals are. That's what everyone else has been doing for years. So we have those type of deals in place with people that um, we're not only doing sync focus stuff or I'm also just booking sessions and, and trying to develop their, their, like I was saying before, like develop their publishing uh, like worth, I guess. Um, but we also have more one-off deals and they're more project-based. So uh, it's a good way to just start working with someone without having to like fully get uh, in a, into a deal. Cause you know, the, the horror story that everyone has in, in this industry is like they did a pub deal with whoever and then their a &R left and they're stuck kind of in this limbo. And so they can't recoup and the publisher's not really putting them in session. So they're kind of stuck. And so uh, that, that, with us, we tend to like do these one-off deals to work with people, um, see if the the relationship's working, making sure every, everything's kind of getting checked off, and then it can kind of graduate into a more traditional deal if both parties want that. Um, so a deal that I signed uh, a few years ago uh, was with a company uh, called Butter, and uh, they basically contracted me and my producing partner to make a sort of seven-song EP that was like, wood kid but like more symphonic sort of thing is that okay. the sort of and like that was it it was just you know you you give us seven tracks and you know you you keep a percentage of your uh your publishing they keep the lion's share you know stuff like this they give you sort of a, a commission per track sort of thing is it those kinds of deals that you're doing as like kind of like project-based deals is that what you're uh, yeah I, I don't know you know without knowing the specifics of what because like deals can like be so varied in terms of like little percentages and things but um it's it's like that so it's not exclusive right so it's basically right. like if you were to do that project with us we would be exclusive for those seven songs or whatever whatever the body work is but like the the deal has nothing in place for past catalog or future catalog got it um and with us it's a co-pub so it's just kind of we look at it as a true partnership so just down, down the middle 50 50. um and then on the master side because we because we've developed a pretty good indie label uh, we sign things on the master side as well. And so we'll actually, you know, do marketing, photo shoots, playlisting, uh, PR, um, you know, distribution. We'll handle all those things. We're not the type of label that's going to like go test radio. You know, we're not, we're not really set up to, to do that, but, um, we're, we're, it's more of a development label. So, uh, in the past couple, we, we use sync as a vehicle to kind of market, put money into the pockets of the artists and also recoup on our side but they also get exposure and we've been able to get a handful of artists or bands signed to majors through our like more our upstream model. So we had like a rock band, Welshly Arms, that did a deal at Republic. Um, we have a, uh, a like R&B pop singer named Timar that um, got a deal with uh, Atlantic through Issa Rae's label, it's called Radio. She was, Issa Rae actually started her label Atlantic and her first signing was Timar. Um, we had a, um, 
uh, alt alternative band um, named uh, Twin XL that was just actually on tour with Fits and the Tantrums before touring stopped. Um, but they got signed to Sony. Um, but these were all kind of built through our building and, and kind of developed. And then once a bigger label comes along that's like, hey, we want to take it to radio, we're like, please, you go do that. We'll right. be publisher. You go do the label thing because you're obviously better at that. But um, it's kind of a way to also kind of backdoor some major label artists and cuts. You know, we get to create it and be there on the ground level. And then when they when they upstream to a major, we'll still fo uh, function as publisher. Sure. Uh, and, and all that kind of makes sense, you know, uh, to, to summarize, you know, shopping around to, to radio stations is an expensive proposition. So expensive. <laughs> really pricey. So, yeah. you know, breaking out into sort of national FM radio uh, is one type of strategy. But like Mike, Mike is saying, you know, it's not the only way to go about it, especially, you know, sync, you know, exposing you to lots of different markets. Uh, realizing also that if you're writing for sync, it's a different sort of process than writing, let's say, your artist project. Uh, you have to be aware of different things if you're like a specific sync band or sync producer, you know, that the, the things that, you know, companies and uh, various liaisons like music supervisors and things like this are looking for might be different than the things uh, that you might instinctively do. So keep that stuff in mind when you're, let's say, writing for a specific goal in mind. And with that, I want to kind of turn uh, to Nana here, who, uh, as part of her class, wrote a four-track EP uh, that she's going to talk a little bit about. Cool. Uh, so, Nana, talk to us a little bit about uh, what you were trying to accomplish with this record. You know, maybe give us a breakdown of the four songs, anything that you kind of want us to know about uh, lyrical backstory for any of these. You know, set the table for us. Okay. Hi, my name is Nana. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. So I'm a singer-songwriter from Japan. My style is usually like re using real instruments and, and kind of J-pop vibe um, songs. But this quarter, I've tried to make something new. So this EP is going to be like electronic, but still J-pop vibe has it, but new style of my music and because it's j-pop style um third song i put japanese lyric on it cool and other things gonna be english but yeah it's gonna be like kind of dance tune uh let's see so maybe let's talk about maybe some of the specific tunes uh your first song salt in the wound uh i guess talk to us about you know maybe uh, how you arrived at that phrase, what the song's about. <laughs> so, Salt in the Wind, um, it's a sad love song. I like writing sad song, but usually when I write sad song, it is kind of calm, mellow, like low tempo of song, but this time I made it up tempo and then using some chord progressions that I've never used before. So it's pretty new. It's a sad song, but also you can feel the like a beat or some like specific scenes sound. So um, for me, lyric is also important. But for this song, I, I want you to listen to the music, the, background music probably so yeah which so, segue is it to your next song rain uh tell us about that one rain so rain is a little bit sad but um there's hope in the song so rain i'm using rain as good thing in the song and i used a lot of like sound that you can feel rain or like water or kind of mysterious sound but also i put beat i mean groove so you can feel the beat this song um lyric is really really important so i use some like vocal um techniques so i think you can listen to the lyrics kind of easily in the song. 
which gives way then to uh, your third tune, uh, which is in Japanese. So I guess tell us maybe about the title, uh, what the, the image is that you're trying to go for with this song. Okay, so the th third song called Yureru in Japanese. Yureru means swaying. It's like, um, how to say, like something is swaying on, on the ocean or on the sea or oh, like in rocking. the water. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this song, I one day I saw a dream when I was sleeping, and that was like a movie. It was like a love story movie, of course, non-fiction, fiction. Fiction means not real, right? Right. Yeah. So I was like, oh wow, it's like a movie. I wanna write song about the movie, like I mean, about my dream. Then because. My image of this song was like ocean, mm, like space, stars, like night mood, calm, mellow. I used a bunch of like mm, reverb sound, reverse piano sound, or a lot of um, instruments technique. And then this song is the longest song in the EP because I was making this song to fit in the like theme because it was based on my dream so it's gonna be interesting which gives way to your fourth song your life uh talk to us about that one okay so your life because it's the last song of the ep i put um some similar instruments from other three songs also melodies or vocal line from other three songs then this song is the most up-tempo song that I've never made before. I use a lot of side chain, a lot of um, synth sound to be interesting. Then the lyric is, I think, really positive. And then I wrote lyrics for the person in other three songs. So I'm three songs are kind of sad mood. So I'm like cheering up them mm -hmm. in this song. Cool. And hopefully you'll all enjoy the twist ending uh, to the EP, the sort of unexpected uh, fin uh, final. So mm -hmm. without further ado, I'm going to play all four songs. And then Mike, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts because uh, I've heard these songs a million times now being you know, uh, uh, Nana's uh, private instructor. Uh, so it'd be great to get your feedback, you know, both from maybe the artist sort of perspective, but also maybe the sync perspective. You know, are there elements, let's say, that, uh, you know, maybe draw you to specific media or anything to keep in mind, you know, uh, for someone like Nana, who's, let's say, looking to maybe have her songs placed in shows, uh, you know, anything to kind of keep in mind going forward after hearing this material. Sure. So, you know.
of them all I've been telling myself that it's me Every time you tell me that I'll be fine You save them all going into song number two. That bridge was ridiculous. Thank you. Blue. Thank you. The sky is blue. But my heart is with her.
Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up on your love. Thoughts, comments? Yeah, I mean, overall, it's really impressive, actually. It's um, really great use of, overall, I noticed um, you have really great use of, like, dynamics throughout your tracks and also, like, arrangement. It's funny, those are, like, two kind of basic things but a lot of producers and writers I work with a lot of my job is like helping shape some of these dynamics and arrangements like so many times even with people that are you know been doing it for years they'll send me a track and I'm like I don't understand where we are in the song right now like it doesn't make any sense you know so you have really you know you already have those nailed like they all the songs like make sense but they're also you you kind of alternate the 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 pop format too you know have like a little instrumental break or whatever so it's cool you know you obviously know the tricks but then we're able to play around them as well which i think is like the key right you gotta you gotta present something to someone in a digestible way but then also have it be interesting which is how you kind of take the form formula and then mess around with it a little bit so i think that was great overall um let's see I'm digging in each song first song had really great tempo um you know, a lot of songs these days, especially if you're not keeping your eye commercially, a lot of people tend to go heavy and behind the beat and slow. You know, I think it's hard to get tempo out of people. Um, so I like that. Grace Dynamics. Um, uh, your choruses really take off, which is great. Like that helps identify what the arrangement is. Sometimes I'll get tracks from people or songs and it's like, there's the chorus, but it's like it doesn't. You, you don't hear a shift in the track or the song so it's kind of like oh okay the lyric change that's the chorus but with you it's like you have a you have a distinct build into your chorus which is great i thought the hook melody was cool you had that like repeating thing at the end of the cadence which you know makes it hooky um so that was cool uh the second song um oh yeah this one uh, i thought the production was really cool you had a lot of like cool like synth leads and just kind of higher end things in the track that were behind the vocal so it didn't compete with the vocal but it like 
it was also filling up that space as well, which I thought was really good. Um, yeah, a good instrumental section in that one as well, which is great. Like instrumental leads or sections, if we're talking sync, are always great for sync because, like I was saying before, a lot of times you're going to strip out vocal. So it's like, how does this song keep interesting if there's no vocal? But like the use of instrumental sections, lead synths, like little little things that fill up usually where the vocal sits um, will will win in sync because uh, they can take out the vocal for key parts, but it's still you know moving the picture. Um, so I could see the second one, I could see it in like, like a, like a drama, like a romance promo or something, you know, something like that. So, um, like a prom, just to be clear too, a uh, promo is a trailer for a TV show basically. So like, you know, next week on power or next week on whatever. Um, the third one, sound design was awesome. You know, you did a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, I think sound design is a thing that's like often overlooked by a lot of at least like pop producers, but it's massive and sync. It's like you know, not just a piano hit, but like, how do we reverse that so that you get a really cool, you know, uh, tension and drama going into a downbeat or something, or you had a bunch of like, you had like a train station or a subway in the beginning, or I forget what, but it was all cool. It adds a lot of texture and um, dynamic to a song without having to like add layers of synth or, or instruments in it. It gives it a whole other warmth and dynamic to it, which is cool. Um, uh, oh yeah, that one I thought was good. It, 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 at parts, the production was really thick, but it was never overproduced, I feel like. You did a good job of kind of, I guess, towing that line maybe. Sometimes people can like just definitely overproduce things. So I think you did a good job of balancing that. Um, the transition into the fourth song was so cool, by the way. I was like, oh, that was cool. Oh wait, oh, we're still going. Oh, we're in the fourth song, very cool. Um, uh these t like this arrangement i i would consider it more of like kind of like an electronic dance arrangement maybe you know you kind of got your key lyric and then you have this big kind of instrumental part like you call it i mean it could be a drop i guess or whatever but um that works well in sync where you just have a key lyric and then you have this kind of instrumental back end to back it up so um that's good i like that um your build overall was great. The final chorus was massive, which I think is really good. Uh, and sync also, you know, these these uh, editors that are pairing music to picture, they're always complaining that they don't have enough parts in music because so much music these days is loop based or it's like, here's your verse and then copy, paste, copy, paste. And every verse is the same. So one thing that's been consistent throughout all of your songs is your songs, even though the form and the arrangement's clear, um, it, they all have kind of like a build or, or there's some variety within your sections, which is great for sync because an editor might be like, oh, I love this verse, but I just wish it was broken down a little bit. And it's like, oh, she did it in the second verse. Great. I can pull that in. Or they're like, oh, man, I love this chorus, but it just doesn't hit hard enough. And then they go to the back end. They're like, oh, man, the back end is massive. I can use that one and they'll kind of slot that in. Um, so that's always a big thing, too, is like, how do you create tracks? that if we're thinking sync gives an editor a lot of variety to choose from without it, without the track itself sounding like a Frankenstein track. Like it still has to be a cohesive song, but um, you got to kind of like have enough paint for them to paint with, you know? Um, so I, I think overall you had a lot of great use of that. Um, but yeah, overall, like really cool, uh, great dynamics, great production. Like that was really cool. So, so Mike, if, someone is let's say going to approach somebody like a uh, position and want to pitch them something what is the typical things you're looking for you know like you said uh it's common for uh you know production leads and things like this to remove top line and stuff so you know things like stems you know what are what are the deliverables i guess for uh for people who are interested in getting into sync and pitching their stuff to labels and and publishing companies yeah, yeah. So you want, you know, you need your high resolution files of your mains, but then your instrumentals, if you can do them, which basically just taking out the, the top line, the lyric. Um, stems are massive um, just because an editor, you might have a song with a shaker and editor is like, ah, that shaker is just eating up the dialogue. I can't have that. And they'll just go in and take out the shaker from the stems. Got to have stems. Um, clean versions like that. That is so massive, to be honest. Like if you have any explicit lyrics, um, you want to have that clean available. It's not as rock and roll, but it's just like the reality of getting, you know, Target's not going to use your music if it has a bad word in it. Um, those mainly. Um, and then uh, sometimes people have what they call TV tracks, which are 
uh, primarily instrumentals, but then they'll have background vocal parts or like kind of like your your chorus gang vocal in it so that they can just kind of quickly put it into like a TV show where there's not a bunch of lyrics to compete with dialogue, but then it just has those like meaty parts, like the background vocal parts or whatever. Um, so that's nice to have if you if it's available, not really, um, you know, the main thing I really look for is what we have to have is I like considered what deliverables that we need to have is like main instrumental stems, definitely. How should they deliver it? Should they send you, let's say, an email to a link with these files? Should they send you a Google Drive? You know, what sorts of ways do you generally accept deliverables? Yeah, it's usually a lot of producers like will hightail me or Dropbox or or uh, Google Drive or whatever. Um, like the, the one of the first bands I ever signed, that they just were new to it, and the producer started emailing me individual stems because he didn't know like how to use Hightail. Don't and do like I, I went into a meeting and I left. And I was like, why do I have sixty emails? And it's like literally like kick drum, you know? And I was like, yeah, don't do that. No, but like, uh, so yeah, so that don't do it that way. Um, yeah, just like uh, you know, it's got to be clear too, you know. Like, there's so many files that like sometimes I'll get something sent. And I'm like, I don't. And like most producers have their own naming systems, you know, like their tricks of how they navigate their computers. But I'm like, I don't know what like one dash one DB slash two means. Like just say like, you know, this song in kick drum or whatever. I don't know. But um, but yeah, just any type of like clickable link that I can grab it from. Do you ever listen to, let's say, artist reels? You know, uh, is that something that people send you uh, if they're, let's say, looking for a uh, not necessarily a sync specific deal, but more of a sort of general publishing deal. Do you ever take things like that? Yeah, I mean, normally uh, when like a manager is pitching a writer, um, it's usually like a blurb of what they've been doing. You know, it's interesting if I if I'm considering someone for a, a more traditional deal, I kind of want to know the networks they're in, the people they're writing with. So it's good to see like even if it's not a release, like hey, working with you know, what X writer or, you know, it's been in with this artist. Like if it doesn't turn into a release, it's still good to know that like, oh, cool. They have at least done this much work and they're in these circles. Um, and then obviously a sampler of music. Um, it's like, you know, just because we're all so busy, it's like really like three to five tracks, like all we really need to know if we want to dig further. Um, sometimes people send you like a beat, like check out my producer's beat pack and it's like 70 beats. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't go through all this right now. It's like paralysis too. Like the, when I open up an email or a link and I see that many beats, I almost won't listen to it because I'm just overwhelmed by it. Or if someone sends me like two or three songs, I can always make, yeah, everyone can make time for two or three songs. But, um, but yeah, so it's just like knowing the networks they've been working in, a sampler of stuff. And then uh, typically it's, you got to like kind of, I need to think of a better phrase. We got to like date a little bit, like, you know, have a meeting, set up some sessions, see how the feedback is. A big part of writers and producers is it's all community based. So like you can be it's it's the same in the musician world, too. It's like if you could be the best whatever, but if like artists or writers don't want to hang with you, then then like every session I set them up with isn't going to turn into more. So it's like a big part of it, too, is like, oh, we're kind of checking each other out and we're interested. Let me let me go put you in a couple rooms with some people and then hear the music. Hopefully it's good. And if it is, let me go follow up with those people, too. And maybe and may, hopefully they're like, oh, man, I loved working with him or her. Like I, I've already called them for another session. Like those are the people that we're very interested in because um, we're really making intros. And then like they kind of kind of like keep going. So it's like they got to have that personality that fits in a room. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a long process. You know, It's not a quick process for sure. Any questions for Mike? Don't be shy, y'all. This is the time. It's covered it all. I have, I have question about the yeah. vocal. Yeah. So, because of the Corona situation, I did like everything in my room, and then because I'm from Japan, I couldn't bring like, uh, uh, what is it, compressor, mm. and compressor mic. So right. I only have dynamic mic. So I was so struggled by editing my vocal mix. Like those situation, like I did my best, but what is the best way to do all the mix if I'm in my room and in those like poor situation? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is like, what's the best way to, to properly mix it you're, you're asking? 
Yes. Um, it's just your vocal. Yeah, I, well, you know, I'm not a mixer, but what I do know that like a lot of my producers and, and people will do is they'll literally take it everywhere. So they'll mix it in their room and then they'll go into their car and listen to it in their car. I, I have people that like, like, like a lot of sync specific people, they want to make sure it bumps on a phone. So they'll like put it on their phone and go, okay, cool. Can I like hear it on my phone clearly? Um, so I think it's just, I think it's bringing it into different environments where the listener is going to have it, right? Like, like I always use uh, AirPods or Apple headphones when I'm listening to things. And like some people in my company will be like, why do you do that? Get some high quality stuff. But like, I, I need to hear music how the ma vast majority of people are hearing it. So like, if I have these like $300 microphones and I'm hearing all these things that no one else is hearing, I have a different flavor of what the majority of people are going to hear it is. So, right. So it's like good on laptop speakers. It has to. And that's the thing yeah. that a lot of producers don't realize is that they mix with their huge, you know, uh, their, their huge, you know, 15s and stuff like this, yeah. and their, and, you know, and, and all that. And you really got to make it sound good on NS tens and laptop speakers. That's totally. really uh, so I guess maybe to piggyback on Nana's question, uh, did anything about the vocal mix, let's say, uh, bother you? Like, as in, was that, was it something you noticed or was it something that like, was there a clear drop in audio quality, I guess is, I guess what she's really getting at. No, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, so. nothing stuck out to me, to be honest. I mean, in all honesty, I'm getting kind of a compressed, uh, sound through my speakers through Skype, but, um, but nothing seemed, uh, uh, you know, poorer quality than the track or anything. It sounded, it sounded pretty clean. <laughs> Other questions? How can we find you? Let's say if we want to, uh, to submit, submit a demo to your uh, company. How are you, are, are you asking uh, how, how to send a demo to my company? Yeah. How, how can we find you? Oh yeah, we have a, oh man, we have a submission. I mean, you can, you, let me, let me get the submissions actually. We have a submissions email where it comes in. And then if you just want to like tag my name, like say this is for Mike Torres or whatever, um, then it'll get to me. Um, let me find that. It's like submissions at position music or something. Uh, really quick what is, I'm, I'm we all we're all on a google chat so i can just ask our person um, music is what it says here so i'm going to post this in the chat here guys uh this is the contact page for uh the company website uh you'll see there uh music submissions there's a oh, cool. email there. sync licensing you know if you're i'm assuming that's more from the sort of b2b side of things uh there's an email yeah. there Artist management, if you're looking, I guess, for one of your like less sync oriented deals, uh, there's a management email there. Uh, and uh, they have they have uh, ways to submit. They say streaming links only. So they don't want you to attach email. Uh, they don't want you to attach files. They want you to have something uploaded to, I'm assuming, something like Google Drive or SoundCloud or something like this. Probably yeah, yeah. the SoundCloud compresses the you know what out of the files. Uh, so uh, be clear, always check to see how they want you to deliver material. Uh, because if you give it to them in a format where they don't want it, if they don't want attachments, don't give them attachments. They won't even listen to it. So make sure you always check. Uh, other questions? Going once. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. So when I submit my demo, like, do they listen to whole intro or should I start singing right away? Because in Japan, like I've heard like a lot of producers won't listen to like long intro. Like for example, my third song had like long intro. It was important, but should I just cut the intro and then start singing right away for the big demo submission? For to, in order to submit, um, I, you know, I think in all reality, when anyone that's listening to your music, it's on a streaming link, they click through it. Like it's, it's not, it's, I wish people would just listen for a full song, but in, in most, some people, are, most people are just so busy. They'll like listen to your intro and then they'll click in and hear, okay, there's the verse and click in. They typically go pretty quickly. And then um, when it grabs them, they'll like, you know, we'll rewind and listen to the whole thing. But that being said, I, I, I don't think you need to trim anything down. Um, it depends on what you're going for as well, though, right? So, like, just knowing the format that you're going for. Like, if you're 
if this is a pop song, like typically pop songs like hit right away, right? So it's like, if that's your goal is to get like, you know, I want this to be like a pop song, then then it's not, you know, then maybe just keep that in mind for the person you're submitting to. Um, but like, you know, your third song, which was much more like sound design and like kind of textural, like that, that wasn't like a quote unquote, like pop song. So like, it's, for me, it was cool to hear that. Like when I heard that, even though your intro was longer in it, when I heard all these cool textures that you were doing as a producer, I thought that was very interesting. So like, if you cut that out, um, you know, I, that would have, that would have been a bummer because I wanted to hear that. I thought it was cool. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. It's just like, what are you doing? Like, what are you aiming for? Like, if it's uh, if you're submitting to a pop person and it's like an epic guitar solo in the beginning, like they're gonna be like, this does not fit, you know. <laughs> but um, it's so it's just kind of making sure whatever you're submitting is, you know, just makes sense, I guess. But I wouldn't worry about the intro thing. Final questions, last thought. Thank you. Well, Mike, thank you. We appreciate your input. And uh, again, that's Position Music. If you want to check out what they're doing, check out some of their artists, you know, perhaps submit something, you know, uh, uh, go for it. You know, the worst they say is no or don't get back to you. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, thanks again. Really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, uh, beers on me next time. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, it was really a pleasure. And, um, great work again. Thanks for sharing your music with me. Hey, take care, guys. See ya.